meet the guys who make it all happen. I'm Pam Marsden, and I'm the producer for Mickey's Twice Upon a Christmas. Jeff is trying to work out his skating moves at the ice rink that we see in Bells on Ice. I'm Jeff Howard, and I'm the creative executive for Mickey's Twice Upon a Christmas. Usually you find Matt in Mickey's house. I'm not sure why Matt likes to hang out at Mickey's house. Who's my pal? I'm Matt O'Callaghan, and um, I was brought on to direct the film. I feel really tall in Mickey's house. It just feels good to be tall. You get to put the star on the tree. We initially brainstormed like 20, 25 different ideas. The studio sort of said, open wide the gates, and everybody pitch your ideas. Bring in everything you've got. So we had ideas from artists. We had ideas from writers and directors. We've whittled down our collection for Mickey's Twice Upon a Christmas to five stories. Some of the deleted stuff that you're gonna see in the DVD is just concept sketches, and some of it is what's called story reel or like a reel. Okay, Pluto, let me know if this is straight. Which is sort of like watching a film strip with uh, the voices and music and sound effects to see how the story is playing before we actually go ahead and fully animate it. Oh, I get it. We started working on the project four years ago, and we wanted to do a follow-up to Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas, but this time we kind of wanted to open it up and do some different things with it. Better get ready. There's a ton of great stuff that didn't make it. There was something called the Christmas Cookie Caper, which was kind of a spoof on detective stories where Mickey is this detective trying to solve the case of Minnie's missing cookies. Keep going! 12 Days of Christmas was a, a beautifully presented story of Donald conducting an orchestra that would play 12 Days of Christmas. We were gonna have different Disney characters playing the gifts of the 12 Days of Christmas, and the two that survived out of that were the hippos and the alligators, which are from Fantasia, and they ended up appearing in Bells on Ice. It's just Jeff wants to be considered one of the gators. I guess it's true, you know, I had tried out to be a backup skater for Minnie Mouse, but you know, they, they didn't pick me. She went with the alligators instead. Whatever, fine, you know, call me Minnie. Never! I think that my personal favorite story that did not make the cut was a short called Christmas Wrapping. It's Christmas Wrapping, which was about Minnie being all alone on, on Christmas Eve and uh, running into the guy of her dreams at the supermarket, who of course turns out to be Mickey, and they end up spending Christmas together. It was a great story, but you know what? We had five other great stories, but it's still an idea that's out there. You may see how Minnie and Mickey met yet. Even with the pieces that did make it into the movie, there's always a lot of different versions of that story that didn't survive. For instance, uh, we knew that we wanted to do something with Minnie and Daisy. That's me! That's me! In some sort of face-off, one of the initial ideas was that they were float makers, where they're building competing Christmas floats for the big Christmas parade. And we had another idea where they were competing uh, window dressers, and uh, we even have had one where it was a cooking show, um, but none of them were really quite right. What were we thinking? And then we all hit on the idea of uh, the ice skating thing. The whole ice skating thing, that just had such a great potential. It's a great showtime kind of environment, and it elicits sort of a, an excitement because they're going to be in a show, and it was nice just to see the two girls together. Merry Christmas. Well, Christmas Impossible sort of sprang from a pitch for a spoof, and it's 
come a long, long way from the original pitch. The initial idea from the beginning was the nephews aren't on Santa's good list. <laughs> So they decide they're going to break into Santa's and put their own names on it instead. Boys, how can you? They can't get into the list room because it's locked with a key. Ah, you, whoa, oh. Originally, the key was on a pedestal, on a big piece of ice and a dome, and the, the polar bear would swim around guarding the key. As we were developing it, it just felt weird. The one thing that did survive was the idea of dropping down and being suspended over something. But instead of being lowered and trying to steal the key under a dome, we just put him right in Santa's office while he was sleeping. And to me, that worked so much better because everybody could relate to trying to do something sneaky in the room when somebody's sleeping. Santa's workshop was one of our favorite environments to create. It gave us an opportunity to explore things that everybody has always thought about. What does Santa's workshop look like? And we think it looks like this. Well, Pam, of course, as the producer, is uh, a big control freak, so she has to hang out in, you know, the, uh, the nexus of all Christmas activity, which is, of course, Santa's office. Mm -hmm. yeah. And she, um likes to um, tell the elves what to do. Oh dear, step aside, duty calls! One of the things that we had to trim down were the number of toys that we could have in our fabulous workshop. Uh-oh. We wanted to have a scene where uh, the key gets lost in a bunch of other keys. We had a bunch of different toy ideas like Good Soldier Sam and Rabbit Rodney and the Dog Pound Pals and something Go Go Ginny. Uh, key to my heart, Katie, and legal loophole, Larry. We also had a deputy doc and a sheriff, Sam, and Houdini. We ultimately went with Jailbreak Bob. Jailbreak Bob? Jailbreak Bob made the story because he had the coolest voice. Be good this year, see, and have a Merry Christmas. When we designed the, the list with all the children's names on it, then we had the dilemma of what do we put on it? Pam came up with the idea, well, let's, let's use some of the crew members' children's names. Good thinking. My kids are Cody and Jordan, and they are both on Santa's list. My children's names are there, too. I didn't have any kids to put on the list, and since I'm sort of a big kid myself, I got stuck on the list, so. But I didn't have to write my own name on there. I was good enough. You gotta check that list one more time, you know. I think. Mickey's Dog on Christmas was another one that went through a lot of different versions. Good idea. The initial uh, treatment was called Reindeer Games, where we had the sequence with other animals going to sort of this fantasy baseball camp. Welcome, everyone, to Santa's Reindeer Camp. Oh! But with reindeer, where different animals go to learn to fly like the reindeer and stuff. The story eventually changed because we really wanted to feature Mickey Mouse and Pluto as much as we could. Just perfect. Oh, and that's when we started working in the idea that Pluto is lost, that Mickey is searching for his best pal. There was a, a series of scenes that we cut out where um, Mickey has his little lost dog flyer, and he walks past a television store window with all the monitors all over, and he gets an idea because he sees these little kids, you know. You know ah. Mickey takes his sign and puts it in front of a video camera so that every monitor reads Lost Dog. It was a very cute little piece, but the pacing kind of got bogged down there, so we had to lose that. That was something that ended up being fully animated, and it was unfortunate that we had to take it out, but, you know, thankfully, you can see it here. I think bringing the stories all together to hang them together as one piece is probably the hardest thing, and maybe that's why we left it till last. This is it, boys. Everything we've worked for. One of the initial uh, ideas that we had for how to connect all the stories was to use this story of Mickey 
unpacking uh, his Christmas decorations. And as Pluto's there, he starts pulling out different things. And each of these items would trigger a memory, a Christmas memory. And we would go into that piece. Just perfect. But as we looked at it, it was a little boring for Mickey. Oh, boy. We were looking back at, you know, old Disney stories. And, and, the, and the, the standard, you know, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty all started with a book. And it, it felt good for going in and out of these stories. And the idea of a pop-up book came to mind because of, of those elements. I am so happy with the way this ended up. I think it's beyond my imagination. I couldn't be more pleased. It's a great mixture of, you know, combining um, great little stories with, uh, you know, the great Disney characters of Mickey and Donald and Goofy and company. And they have a lot of energy and, and a lot of heart. We ended up with these five just because we had to make a choice and draw the line somewhere. Otherwise, we would have included more and more. It was really, you know, a tough thing to make choices, but in the end, the movie turned out great. Now it's perfect. These movies aren't made by just a couple people. I mean, you know, you look at the credits and there's, a, there's hundreds of people on these things. And that's, you know, the great thing about it is that everybody gets to put a little bit into the movie to call their own, and, and that's what makes it special.